what to call this. Uh, what I like about it is that I was able to manipulate it and reconfigure it. Um, and it, because it's offset, I can scrape along a board with it and uh, not get my fing big fat fingers in the way. Um, what it's actually called, I have no idea. Typically, like I said, they, it come, when you buy any of their cheap, uh, like $10 sculpting sets online, it's one of the tools that typically comes in one of those. So, um, oh, thank you, Don. Uh, that's, that's really nice, thank you. Hopefully this one can be good too. Oh, that's good. Uh, I would love to know what kind of plastic planos are made out because it's like the best thing for. So for any of you who are joining who were in yesterday's class, well, we've got a couple of minutes here yet. Um, here's how my fern leaf turned out after I put it on the pen. So for those of you who were in yesterday's class and we did organics or those of you who weren't, we did organics yesterday. And one thing we did was, was, was ferns. So as you can see, after I curled it around the pen, it took a nice curl on it. You'll never see the bottom side if you stuck that on a base and had like four or five of them, they have a nice little set of ferns. So, all right, is it time to get going, David? It is currently 12.01, so yes, it is time. All right, uh, let me see. Quickly. All right. So for everybody who was here yesterday, hopefully this beginning part won't be too much of a repeat. Um, I have had actually some requests to repeat the tool section, but we're going to because there will maybe new people here today and we need to recover the tools. So these are the tools that I'm going to be using. You don't necessarily need all of these tools. You could probably get by with the number one and number three and number four pretty much alone. But one through five are pretty essential. Everything else on the list is kind of secondary. Um, but having, and the dental spatula isn't really required, okay? What you do need is a metal tool that has got a almost sharp edge that you can use for manipulating the putty. So you want something about that size. I know some guys use a dulled X-Acto knife blade. I've seen... Some people use a spear point. What I like about this one is that it's got an offset angle, which allows me to do things like run along a board and not have to try to get my big fat fingers underneath the tool and, or, and come in from the side as much. So, um, so yeah, so this is the tool that I use. This is my primary bulk out tool. Um, that's why I say AKA rough in tool. Um, this is what I use to apply putty to miniatures, move it around, push it around, get the general shapes down and all that. Um, this tool here is what I like as a detail tool. Other people do different. This one's fairly highly polished. I make it myself. It's just piano wire that I sharpened into a point. You could do the exact same thing with a T-pin um, or even brass wire, it's, although brass wire will dull easier. And I just flattened it on my jewelry anvil. You could flatten it on almost any kind of hard steel surface with a hammer and then ground it on on sandpaper and and varying grits of sandpaper until it got this shiny it's again it's not quite sharp it's almost sharp i could stab it into my finger probably pretty easily actually i have um i do bleed for my art but it's almost sharp um so you can see how thin it really is and you need that thinness because this is what you're this is what i'm doing a lot of the cutting in and shaping and moving and stuff. Um, I also use a scalpel. I never put a scalpel in a scalpel handle. And the reason being is the scalpel handle is flat. And when you're sculpting, you need to be able to follow things around on a miniature. So as you're working a fold or whatever, um, having round tools, you'll notice all my tools have round handles on. And that's so that as I'm working, I can be turning the tool to meet what's going on, right? So um, I just, taking a standard X-Acto knife blade. Actually, I found this really cool ergonomically correct. But once I started having hand issues, I found an ergonomic uh, handle that's a lot nicer, but a standard X-Acto knife handle works just fine. The, the blades 
just fit into the chuck and you just crank down on them if, and, um, and they work. But I don't use X-Acto knife blades because um, scalpel blades are considerably sharper than an X-Acto knife blade. And you, you really, it, it doesn't seem like it should be, but you will notice the distant difference as you're sculpting. I mean, it really changes how it affects, uh, goes into the putty and moves in the putty and stuff. This is a feather. I think if you guys can see that. There we go. Should be a feather 11. So this is mine. This one's made in Japan, apparently. But I always get the feather ones because they're slightly thinner and a little sharper. Um, but I think there's several brands that make the feather type. Um, so I use a feather number 11. Um, I buy them in boxes of 100. Usually they're off of Amazon. Whatever's cheapest is what I grab. Pointy tools. So yes, that is a technical term. Um, it, uh, I've heard it coined by Julie Guthrie, so it must be the right term for those um, because we know Julie would be right. And um, I have a couple different types of pointy tools that I make because you want different pointiness in your pointy tool. This one is super pointy um, and very, very sharp. And this guy is actually like a darning needle that I stuck into a big pen and capped off with some putty. The other thing that you're going to want uh, to get at some point, if you're going to do a lot of sculpting, you don't necessarily have to have them. You can smooth with a metal tool or with your fingers. Um, fingers actually work really good for smoothing if you know what you're, how to do it, and I'll be showing that a little later. But um, color shapers, and I like the color shapers, and we found out yesterday that to search for them, you want the British spelling of the word color. It won't come up with, with the American spelling. Um, the color shape, color size zero firm color shapers are firmer than the clay shapers firms. So we found them on Dick Blick yesterday. Um, you can get a set of them size zeros. They aren't necessarily super cheap, but they will help your sculpting out considerably. And these things are, are I, I love these over any of the clay shapers I've ever found because they've just got so much less give. And, and they, they move to move the putty a little better. Um, and you'll be seeing me using those off and on. Uh, this is a special tool that I made. We're gonna show it a little closer here. Um, it's just a bridge. All it is, is I rounded off the end of a piece of piano wire, pounded it flat, rounded it over the horn of my jeweler's anvil and curved it over the horn of my jeweler's anvil and then just sanded a curved surface into one side of it. And what this is used for is to take uh, new putty and squish it down over the surface of hard putty, right? And it draws it out and brings it down to a really, to blend it into the current, a smooth surface. Um, so this is kind of a little more specialized tool, but a lot of people have a hard time and don't understand how to get, how to not have a little bump where the new putty came on. Came on. Well, this is how it takes a lot of work and effort. I don't know that this class is going to cover that much because that was more what I taught my organic shapes class, but I thought I'd cover the burnisher a little bit here again. This class is going to actually focus a lot more on my diamond files because um, we are going to do some sanding and polishing and scraping and making things flat. So I wanted to show my diamond files in this class more. So I have a set of diamond files. You don't necessarily need files, diamond files, any files would work or just sandpaper. And we will also be using sandpaper in this class because sandpaper is is a, a key component in making hard edge surfaces so i have sandpaper here at the ready um all right so i'm going to clear the table so everybody got their their last any pictures of this they want to take oh let me answer the questions here what's the difference between a pointy tool and a spear tool um good question the pointy tool is round the spear tool is flat with a knife edge on to both sides. So the spear tool is actually a spear. So if you can see that how it's a, how it's a little spear. And the pointy tool is actually just a round. It's just it's just a pin, essentially. Um, would a thin nail work for making tool number two or six or does it have to be a wire? A nail would work, but you you're gonna there's a there's a wedge in the tip of a nail. So the a nail's tip is three flat surfaces that come together. So you'll have to grind that down to be smooth and then flatten it up. But a nail is just mild steel. So that should work very well, actually. Uh, mild steel is way better. A, a T-pin actually might be kind of tough because it's hardened steel. 
And so pounding that flat might be a little, you might actually almost have to heat it up to take the temper out of it to, to pound it flat. Whereas an actual, like a finishing nail or whatever, uh, would actually give you, be a lot easier to, to pound out because it is uh, mild steel and should be considerably softer than the hardened T-pin. Good question. Um, and anytime I get to talk about metallurgy is a good day. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm a total forge and fire geek. So, I mean, that's, that's like my world, my favorite show of all time. So I'm going to put my tools away a little bit here and clean the station quick. So let's talk about what we're going to do today. So today in this class, we are going to cover um, making man-made items and applying them to your miniatures, right? So I got this Minotaur and we're going to put some additional things onto him. So uh, we're going to make some straps. We're going to make a backpack. We're going to make a buckle on the straps. Um, and I think I'm going to make a very large sword that would fit into the hand of this guy that would come off to the side. So that's the other side of things. So, uh, we're going to go through the making of a weapon. That's actually probably like the last half hour of this class or the last hour of the class, uh, is, is making harder weapons. Cause it's a, like a four stage process. So you're going to see me do a few things of put this away, let it cure, come back. So when you're doing hard edge things, there's a lot of curing steps between quite often, right? Um, Never mind the weird horn. If you weren't in yesterday's class, uh, that was the horn we added um, yesterday. So anyway, so a little bit more about a couple other materials that we're going to be using today. So this class does require a few more materials than your typical organic green stuff sculpting. Um, green stuff, of course. Um, I keep mine, keep it in the freezer uh, when you're not using it. Um, if, especially if you're going to go long periods of time without using it, the blue will start to get stiff and harden over time on you and will make it much harder to use. Since I haven't been doing a lot of hand sculpting anymore now that I went to ZBrush, uh, mine's actually starts stiffening up here a bit, but it's still pliable enough that I can uh, make it work for me and, 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 and do what I need it to do. But over time, it'll start getting to the point where it won't mix well and that will become something that you have to deal with um, and you might as well and then throw it away to keep it from happening, put it in the freezer. Um, I always recommend that you do not buy your green stuff in the little ribbons if you can avoid it because where the two parts meet, they are going to be curing where they're touching. And over time, as you keep that on your shelf or keep that around, that's gonna cure up regardless of temperature. So you really don't want the ribbon. The ribbon is there um, for ease of use. Um, and I guess if you aren't gonna be doing it very often, it's still a cheaper option. But if you can get the tubes of green stuff, uh, I think they usually cost between $12 and $20 on Amazon or, or online. Um, that'll be enough green stuff to last you a very long time to do quite a few miniatures out of. And if you keep it in the freezer, it'll keep forever. All right. The other thing we're using today is epoxy sculpt. Epoxy sculpt, why am I using green stuff and epoxy sculpt in this class? And I know I advertise green stuff, but Surprise, you, we actually have to go to epoxy sculpt for this particular class. And the reason I'm doing that um, is green stuff itself is not toolable. You can't file it, you can't, you can't sand it. Uh, you can cut it, but you can't, and you can scrape it, but that's about it. Um, so a lot of what we're doing this class do with just green stuff, but the sanding portions of the class, you would have to use a, use a sharp blade and scrape instead of sand. And that's just a lot more work. Um, epoxy Sculpt all, and, and it's in another product called Milliput are um, a toolable putty that you can mix with green stuff to change the properties of green stuff. I don't like working with them on their own. They're squishy, they're soft. They don't, I don't enjoy the way they mix up, but when you use a 50-50 mix of the two, you get this light green type of putty that's hard as a rock and can be sanded, filed, ground, drilled, you name it, it'll take it. So um, that's what I tend to do when I am, uh, <clears throat> that's what I'm trying to do uh, when I am um, doing hard edge surfaces or any kind of underpinning uh, underpinning, definition of underpinning means um, putting on a layer of putty 
in a form or shape that will take that will bulk up something so that you can then on top of that put your detail layer because detail layers are typically applied at one to two millimeters a, at a time um, you almost always underpin underneath it and then add the very final layers of detail on top of that um, what size piano wire do i use for the spear point god i don't remember um i think that's a millimeter I'd have to get my caliper, but um, that looks to me about a millimeter. Whatever that translates to. Sorry, I'd have to. I, I made this thing ten years ago, so I, I'm not really sure right now. Uh, I could look it up. Uh, throw throw that throw that question into my chat, and I will get you an answer later on. Um, how long does it take to thaw from the freezer? Uh, very surprisingly fast, actually. Um, you can take it out of the freezer and in usually about a half hour, it's ready to roll. Um, it's, it, it, it actually thaws out much quicker than you, than what you would say, something that has water in it. It doesn't have any water in it, so it comes to temperature pretty fast. Um, you can mix green stuff and milliput okay. I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, I've heard of some people doing that, and I think they, that works just fine. They're all epoxy resins, and so they, they work together fairly surprisingly well. Um, I, I'm pretty sure milliput and epoxy sculpt are very similar in what makes them up. The big difference, and this is why I would recommend getting epoxy over milliput, is milliput has very large grains in its white side, I believe, or the yellow side of it. Um, one of the one of the two parts has fairly large grain structure, right? It hasn't been ground really fine. And so from an art perspective, those grains can get in the way of your art. So I <coughs> I really don't like Milopa, but for that reason, it's good if you're just bulking stuff up and you want something cheap, um, it's great for that. But epoxy sculpt is still considerably cheap and doesn't, especially if you buy it in, in large quantities. Um, the only reason I have these two little, the two little tubs here today, I usually buy it, used to buy it in much larger quantities, is that somebody forgot to put his in the freezer and it got all gross and separated. So I had to quickly buy a new set before this, uh, before this class, since I, like I say, I don't, I don't sculpt uh, a lot of hand stuff uh, in the, in the past year since I went to ZBrush. Um, I do sculpt some, I'm still doing dogs for Dark Sword in hand, by hand. Um, anyway, that said, uh does yes and you definitely want the epoxy in the freezer as well so when i'm done teaching these class these two little guys are going straight over to my deep freeze so yep absolutely okay so let's on on to the class um a couple other things we're going to talk about today so just now i'm going to get into some specialty tools and materials that you will or will not you, you may or may not need you will need um structures for support and so i usually have a selection of I buy, and they're all kind of tied together right now because they were down in my sculpting bag, um, various gauge gauges of silver coated copper wire. I like it, it's, you get them at beading stores it, or, um, or I get it off of Amazon. Um, I get gauges anywhere from I think eight is my biggest all the way down to 24 I think is what I use depending on supporting dot like 24 for EDB little schnauzer ears or whatever. Um, it, my workhorse is somewhere in the middle, um, probably like uh, 12 to 18 are the, is the, really the sizes I use the most. Um, but this is the wire um, and you will see how I use that today for this. Um, you will need some copper wire. You don't need to get beading wire. Any copper wire will work just fine. Um, go to Home Depot and buy a giant roll for almost nothing if you want. That works great too. Um, yes, I like copper because it has ductile properties that aluminum does not have. Um, it's pr primarily it's malleability um, because I can take the copper on my jeweler's anvil and this is the next tool and take my forge hammer and copper moves and aluminum is not as pr predictable with the, on a forge so i can forge this real easy without having to really think about it and we will be forging today so um you don't need a jeweler's anvil you don't need a, a jeweler's hammer i am a jeweler so i have both um but these actual jeweler's hammers are really 
anvils are really nice. I think you can get a small one, a simpler one than this one for under 20 bucks on Amazon. They're pretty cheap. Um, and they give you a nice hardened surface for pounding out this stuff. So as we get into doing weapons, you're gonna see what I use this for, why I use it. Um, I, I do like my jeweler's hammer. You can see it looks really old and stuff. That's because I got it off of an estate sale of a, of a jeweler. And I love getting used tools that look like they've that, that they've seen life. And, and man, this one just has so much care. But any good, like a ball peen hammer, a round point hammer will work for this. Um, you, I seldom use the actual the forge end, uh, the uh, drop. Uh, I forget the name of it. Sorry. Cross beam. There we go. Cross beam. Anyway, that's it. Um, okay, so I've answered the any reason for copper over aluminum. Um, you could probably try aluminum. I guess I've just never really tried it. I, I just like the way copper moves so um, and stretches and adjusts. So, um, and I think it's cheaper, but I don't know. Okay, not, not sure on that one. Oh, thank you. I always forget the cutting board. Uh, excellent question. So very important tool, probably the mo one of the most important tools of my arsenal is a flat surface. So you can use just um, a cutting mat like this. That works great. I don't really like to use my cutting mat for it because I have a maple cutting board that I found that I can resurface anytime I want. Let me make sure I still got my dot in focus. That's my know where the zoom in is going to happen square. Um, so what this is just a maple cutting board and you can actually see right here the outline of the dolphin's tail. So when I did the Reaper dolphins, I had actually cut and still etched down inside there. Um, this cutting board, I, I started using this from the very beginning. I can sand this down and resurface it whenever I need to in my wood shop and take it down with it with 400 grit sandpaper until it's glass for, I think I even go to 600 and get it glass smooth. And then I rub Vaseline into it until it is got this nice putty doesn't stick to it finish on top of it, right? And it's actually getting really close to needing a new refinishing here. Um, and so the other tool that I forgot to mention again is Vaseline. And so you absolutely need to use Vaseline uh, for a lot of these things. Um, some people try to use water. Some people don't want to use Vaseline. I do, I, I know some guys, um, Julie does this, especially for her faces, is uses her nose, um, uh, nose grease. Uh, the grease from the side of the, the pores on the side of your nose actually works as a pretty good um, grease. I use Vaseline. Um, when you use the Vaseline, you want to make sure you have some Vaseline on your fingers before you mix your putty because the Vaseline gets in with the in, into the putty and Vaseline in putty mix will stick. Putty with Vaseline in it will stick to putty that has Vaseline on it. So um, that's a it's kind of an important thing because if you don't mix it in with your putty and you are trying to apply it to something you've done before, it may not stick to it unless you have that Vaseline inside of it. I would think bamboo cutting boards work just fine. Uh, it, the, the key is sanding it not really nice and smooth with uh, sandpaper, get down to like a four to 600 grit, and then just rub the heck out of it with Vaseline until the Vaseline soaks into it. And I think it would, the bamboo would be just fine. In fact, bamboo is a really nice, nice material for cutting boards because it, it really resists um, holding on to cuts. Um, so anyway, so let's get going. Um, so today what we're gonna do is uh, I think we're going to start out by doing some straps. Um, if there's anything in particular or structure that you guys want to see that I'm not covering, um, that would be good to hear. Um, so I can plan it in. But what I'm planning on doing to start with is we're going to go through straps, buckles, um, and uh, making a backpack or other type of bag like that. We'll probably add a bag to his belt somewhere. That way we can cover a little bit of cloth. And then we're going to get into doing his weapons. And that'll be kind of a little bit longer um, process. So, and I don't see more. So, so right now, just going to get my two balls of putty about equal. Not quite. You want yellow to be about 10% larger than the blue. And I got a little more than I want there. 
Um, I don't really know why that is. If you ever look at the ribbon putties, you'll see that the yellow side is always a little bigger than the blue. That's knee to tight, giving you the proper proportions. Um, but that's just what they say. It's not absolutely necessary. I do know um, some sculptors who sculpt with maybe almost half again that much yellow to their blue and they get a really, if you ever look, you'll see um, some of the sculptors have really kind of bright green miniatures uh, on the site. Others have more bluey miniatures. Um, so I do know some that actually sculpt with a, with a, um, with an even 50-50. Um, I've done that on occasion. The blue is the hardener. So the more blue you put in, the more it will harden. Uh, no, the green stuff does not come in these containers. Um, this is a, these are bead, uh, stackable beading jars that I put them in. That way I can keep the bulk of my green stuff in the freezer and just put what I'm gonna use for the next couple months uh, in, green, in, in these containers. Um, anyway, so the, the, the blue and the yellow, sh this is about a typical progression, right? Uh, for, for what you want. So I'm gonna just mix this up. When mixing, I just flatten them together roll them over. What I'm going to try to do though is avoid um, trapping bubbles. So I'm always kind of like folding and squeezing from the edge of the from the edge of the fold. Um, I try to um, because I don't really want a lot of bubbles in there. The bubbles will show up in my, I got yellow underneath my thumbnail. Um, you, you don't want a lot of bubbles in there. You want to try to avoid getting bubbles because otherwise it'll literally show up in the surface of your miniature. And if you get a bubble on the surface of your miniature, it's going to happen. I mean, it, it happens quite often. Um, it's easiest to wait for it to cure, cut it out, and then put a little more putty over the top of it and fix it that way, than to try to pick at it and destroy the detail that you're, that you're getting. There are ways that you can get in there while it's still, still wet to pop the bubble and then reseal it, but sometimes it's just easier to let it, let, let it happen, cut it out, and re-sculpt re over the top of it later. Um, kind of depends on the size of the bubble, where I am, what I'm doing, if I'm going to try to get a bubble out from under a sheet. Armor. Okay. Yes. Well, the techniques that I'm going to use to make the backpack and the techniques you would use to do armor are pretty much identical. So the, the key is the technique issue is going to mostly be um, yeah, well, maybe we'll throw a shoulder shoulder pad on armor on them too later on. So good question. Um, but the techniques are going to be really similar in that getting a hard edge is getting a hard edge. And that's the hard thing to do with green stuff. And that's the thing that most people have a struggle with. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is going to show things that you could use for things like a backpack, armor, leather, that kind of stuff. Um, but anything that you want a hard edge for. All right. So there we go. So green stuff is mixed. So let us make a strap. So I'm just gonna roll out a snake. As I told my class yesterday, all that you learned when you were in kindergarten with playing with Play-Doh is absolutely 100% applicable to sculpting with green stuff. You are still going to make snakes, you are going to make balls and you are gonna squish out sheets. That's pretty much green stuff sculpting in a nutshell. So you didn't realize you were learning so much when you were five. So I got too much, uh, <laughs> I got too much Vaseline on my board and it won't stick enough to the board to roll. It happens. Okay, I'm gonna go to the other part of the board then. I actually like having different parts of my board have different, you can see the different colors in the board, how it's light over here and dark over here because this is the area that I heavily Vaseline and this is the area I leave a little more sticky. And I do that for, because some things you want a little sticky, some things you don't want any stick. So that's why I like the, the wood board because I'm able to adjust that so much easier. When you're on like a plastic surface, it's all going to be, you know, that Vaseline is not going to soak in. So you're not going to be able to adjust the, um, the stickiness of it in any way, shape or form. Um, it's just going to be what it is. So that's probably pretty good. So this is going to be our strap. So here's our, let's, uh, we'll put it on this guy. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to pin one end down so that it stays down. And I'm going to use, uh, my number one tool, my, as I call it, my rough end tool, get a little bit of putty on it. 
And this is where everybody was wanting me to zoom in yesterday. So let's see if I can get zoomed in on that. Let me get that moved over. So what we're really just going to do is we're just going to take and lightly, and if you can see my, my tool, this would be flat, and I'm just angling it just a hair, right? So it's basically I'm dragging the back edge of the tool across that snake. So I'm just going to keep dragging it until I press and pressing lightly onto it. Not putting a lot of pressure here. I don't want to just squish it all over the place. If I put a lot of pressure, it's just going to squish out. See, you know, so you don't want to do that. Uh, you want just nice, even pressure until you get it to about the, the thickness you want. Now, you want to square up those sides. So to make them nice and square, you just take your tool at a 90 degree angle and run them along the tool and come back on the other side. Now, if this was too thick, you could cut it with your scalpel, come along and cut it out and make, make it that way. We could also make the strap if I rolled a whole sheet of green stuff out, I could cut strips off that sheet. I do that as well quite often, but I kind of like doing it this way for um, straps because it gives me a little bit of unevenness to the edges, not a lot. I mean, it's, it stays pretty true but it gives me just a little bit of a rounded edge uh, more so than if I were to cut it out of a sheet. And I like that a little bit because you don't normally see belts and stuff that are super sharp. It's leather, right? So you don't really want a super sharp edge on it. So to get it off, and here's why I like the dental spatula is getting putty off of my cutting board. If this were a flat tool, I would have nowhere for my fingers to go to get the right angle. Where with this offset tool, I'm able to slide the tool at an angle underneath and pull it off. So it comes off nice and even. So you have a choice. Remember I said if you might, if you wanted to have a sharp edge, put the side that was down to the board and you're gonna get sharp edges. Put the side that was up and you're gonna get slightly rounded edges. So it really depends on the feel of the model you're trying to create. So you could put either side up, doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to take and do it the, uh, actually, I'm going to cut this in half so I can do both straps. This should be enough for both straps. And now the hard part is actually getting it to stick to the model. So we're going to put this over his shoulder here. And I think I need to have a little bit more that way. Now I'm going to find a spot that I know I want it and just tap it down just lightly, right? And now it's gonna go onto his back. Oop, I'm sorry guys, I'm off camera. David, if you could let me know if I'm severe enough camera on occasion, that would be great. Yeah, it, ju it just went off uh, right before okay. you noticed it too. I'm, I'm getting better at noticing now. After, after yesterday's class, I was always, she, she was like, um, you're off again, so. Yeah, um, you've been also seeing questions as they've been coming up so that, uh, there is one currently in there. They said to tape down your board if you have some tape. Uh, uh, I've been moving my board around. It's actually, I've been trying to actually move to different areas where it's different stickiness. So I, I don't think I'd want to do that for this. Um, because there's reasons to have my board oh, moving. Uh, you're a little up. Sorry. Oh, All right. There we so, go. So, it, we're just gonna move this around, wrap, wrap it around. So we're, we're bringing it through. Um, you'll want to, you will want to kind of press lightly as you go, because if otherwise you'll get gaps underneath it, that'll bump up. Now, if you wanted this to not follow his, the curve of his muscles quite so much, if you wanted it to be more like it was taut across, you'd have to pack a little more putty underneath that space and make a bridge. Otherwise it's gonna pack, otherwise it is gonna follow his muscles. And for this case, we're just gonna let it. Um, but if you wanted it to be say taut across so that bump right there, you would have had to come in and pre underpin that to make that so that it wasn't flowing, following. Uh, you went a little bit up from the camera when you explained that there. Okay. The uh, bump part. Oh, so yeah. So if you wanted this bump here to not follow his muscle so so perfectly there, right? What you would want to do is before you laid this down would be to put to fill that hollow in with putty and then lay that across and it would be nice and taut. 
So it's really, or you can also kind of like cheat it in here now. So I'm just going to get this finished. I'm going to pull this. You can also pull the putty a bit if you need to. It's it's stretchable. It's nice thing about green stuff. It stretches where epoxy sculpt or milliput will rip. All right. So there we go. That guy's down. Good enough. And that's a strap. All right. So we'll do the other side quickly so we can get on to underpinning. Um, I'm doing the wrong side, aren't I? But I did the hard side that time, so I will flip it over. And you can see the green stuff fights with you. There we go. So I want to make sure it's far enough along. All right, there we go. Put it right next to that armor joint there. Good enough. So you, one thing you want to try not to do is dig into the putty with the edge of your tool as you're doing this because you'll leave a little mark and that mark will be kind of hard to get out. Now, if you're not sculpt, if you're not doing this for casting, you really don't have to fill in behind it. So if you wanted that out a little bit, I just thought of this now, I'm used to having to cast. You could always come in and pull that up so that it goes across tight. Who cares if there's a gap under it? You're not gonna cast it. So if it's just for you and your painting, it'll look more realistic if it's actually stretched across there. As long as you do it before it hardens, you can do that. So. So I am just going to try to match where these come in so that they look like they came off of a single manufactured item and tack it down. So here are our straps. So at this point, I'll take either my cupped clay shaper or my flat edge, ugh, flat edge clay shaper and just run along this to make sure it's tamped down where I want it tamped down. We'll let it stretch across that area, but I definitely want it tamped down on his shoulders. I definitely want it tamped down under here. I'll make sure it here's the mini. And one thing that we found out with bones, this was kind of found this out yesterday during class. Um, if anybody was in my class yesterday, you'll know that the pug didn't want, the uh, putty did not want to stick to the pug's butt. So, um, if you're gonna use putty on bones, probably should wash them first. Make sure that there's no mold release on them because it was definitely causing me problems yesterday. And they really stick well to the brown liner or the sepia liner that I used as a, as a uh, primer. They seem to stick way better, just like paint does. They seem to stick better. But the problem with it is because you're using Vaseline on the green stuff, this has to be washed before you paint it. So, uh, but I'm pretty sure the brown liner can handle the scrubbing, so. Um, I would, I think, I think if I, from this day forward, I'm going to probably prime before I put green stuff on bones because it, it sticks a lot better. All right. So I'm going to zoom back out again and let's go talking backpack. So the next step that we got to do is we want to build the backpack, right? So you can, you could just take a wob of green stuff and stick it on there in the shape that you want it to be and go ahead and do all your sculpting right away. However, a beginning sculptor is probably not gonna be very successful if they try to do that. The, that big lump of putty is gonna be squishing away from your tools and getting into, into a mass and a, a massive lump of goo that's gonna be really hard to control, gonna be really frustrating. You're gonna walk away going, ah, oh, it's just a pain in the butt. Um, a person who's been sculpting for quite a few years is, um, can probably handle it because you've got that feather touch after a while, right? And and that's that's fine. I mean, so Gene Van Horn or or Bobby Jackson or Julie Guthrie, those guys, they're just gonna you'll you'll see them. They'll throw a whole backpack on, just sculpt it and turn out wonderful. But when you're fresh to this and you're starting out, um, 
you don't want to go there. Um, so what I always recommend to most of my students, and I still do this a lot myself, there's definitely structures that I would not attempt to do straight up um, just because I'm going to be much more successful, much more hard edges if I put a good underpinning under them first. So that's what we're going to do now. next is we're going to underpin the backpack. So um, yeah. Epoxy sculpt mixes 50 50. So I get my epoxy sculpt into a ball. And then I get an equal size ball of green stuff, approximately. Squish them together. And this is what I do use to make. If you've ever seen any of my tutorials, I do a lot of sculpting, um, did a lot of sculpting um on the reperforms uh in the sculpting section so if you ever see any of my older ones in there you'll notice that a lot of my underpinning and the the base anatomy of almost all my creatures and everything i make is all this light green color and that's because i use this epoxy sculpt green stuff blend to do almost all my underpinning it dries hard as a rock it is not flexible so unlike green stuff, there's no flex to it at all. So if you need flex, like in this leaf that we did yesterday, you do not want to use epoxy sculpt because you will get no flexibility. This would just break. If, if this was done in epoxy sculpt mix and I did and I tried to flex like that, it would crack and break. But when it's done, this will be hard as a rock. You can file it, sand it, shape it, do whatever you need it to do, right? So it also gets a little squishier than green stuff. It, 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 it's got different properties. So could I do my final final sculpting in this? Absolutely. Uh, Jason Weeby actually does. He actually gets green epoxy sculpt. So it looks like his green stuff and does a lot of his sculpting in a mix of green stuff and epoxy sculpt. Um, is This 50-50 this mix is one of his go-tos for like when he does hand sculpting. Uh, you have a couple of questions in the Q&A section. Uh, one of them's asking if we don't have a epoxy sculpt, will we better be better off just watching and paying attention? Yes and no. Um, I should have said this at the very beginning of the class. You are only going to be able to sculpt along for a certain period today. Um, this class uh, description was going to be more of a demo, which is why I didn't provide material lists ahead of time, because um there's no way to do this class in two hours it's not even possible you have to have cure times and everything to get this class to go so i think you are all, all be better off just watching paying attention and taking notes and then trying it after the fact i'll still be around on discord all weekend um and can sit and help with people if they have any questions or issues that, that crop up um but yeah so um as we get going forward you are definitely going to need epoxy sculpt. You're going to need, but you can do it with green stuff. So go ahead if you really need to. Um, you're just not gonna be able to do the sanding portions that I'm gonna show you. You're gonna have to scrape and I will demonstrate how to scrape. So if you want to do this with all green stuff, you can, but caveat, green stuff does not take a hard edge nearly as easily as epoxy sculpt does. Um, define underpinning. Underpinning means to, fill in an area with putty that you do not intend to be seen by anyone else. So when you sculpt, uh, do I have any sculpts in progress that I can show? Let me think, I don't, I have a few maybe. Give me one second, let me look at my box. Yes, excellent. So here's a miniature that I have underpinned the skeleton and the uh, chest cavity. So the only miniature are the tips of his claws. Everything else is underpinning. So what does underpinning mean? It's, it's the parts of the miniature that are going to, so I'm going to lay. So whenever I do anatomy, I underpin the whole miniature. So you start with your ar arm, your armature, and then you add your underpinning, which is going to be all of your underlying anatomy support what's above it. I don't 
ever go straight to lob on a bunch of putty and just sculpt to the end detail. That just never happens. Um, so you typically underpin a miniature first and get that hard base to work from. And you, sh you typically only sculpt your detail in about the last millimeter of putty. And usually you want a hard surface to be doing that on. Otherwise, as you're pressing, as you're doing that detail work, if it was wet underneath and soft, it's going to be squishing away from you, moving away from you. And that's why you're not really going to be able, able to follow along perfectly in this class because I've already done the underpinning on some of the steps of what I'm going to be showing you. And we're going to have to do the, and now it's cured type thing, right? So um, this class requires cure times between steps. And that's just not something that's possible. But that would be what underpinning is. So we're about to underpin the backpack. Um, so that's what I'm what I'm about to show here. So what you want to start out with is the backpack minus about a millimeter of putty. All right. So what I'll do is I'll form it in my fingers and get the rough. So this is going to be a rectangular backpack. So I'm going to get the rough shape of the backpack, kind of where I want it to be. Um, not doesn't have to be perfect. Using my fingers. But you see how I'm pulling in some tight corners on it and stuff to try to get them in as good as I can before I stick it on the miniature and really kind of get that shape about what I want it to be first. And so I just work it over with my fingers to try to get that right. Um, bear in mind, these all epoxies all have epoxy resin in them. Some people are sensitive to epoxy resin. So if you are one of those people or you're not sure or you are sensitive to, you have sensitive skins and stuff, you might want to use um, nitrile gloves while doing, while working with green stuff. But anyway, so I'm going to put the backpack on and just lightly adhere it to his back and just press it in a bit with my finger and use my finger to shape it a bit. Now, this is underpinning. It doesn't matter if there's a fingerprint on it because it's going to get a layer of putty over the top of it anyway. So. I want the backpack to have a little bit of form, not you know, not necessarily a square. I mean, he's not, he doesn't have a solid metal backpack on. Um, he could, I guess we could sculpt a solid metal backpack. So we'll zoom in a little bit and I'm just gonna take my rough in tool, my number one, this is my, my Will Riker. Um, and just, kind of get those edges a little crisper. So the way you get a sharp edge, and like I said, epoxy sculpt G, G, uh, green stuff is going to take a sharp edge easier than green stuff alone. Green stuff has more memory and the epoxy sculpt removes some of the memory from the green stuff, which means it doesn't remember the shape that it is in and it's not quite as elastic. So it gets a nice sharp edge like that much more readily. So sometimes if I'm doing a hard edge shape, like when I did, um, uh, I did a sci-fi lady for a guy once, actually a lot of my final details were done in, in epoxy sculpt, green stuff mix, because she needed so many hard edges and green stuff is just not made for hard edge work, right? It's just not good at it. Um, uh, another putty out there that you can look into, it's expensive. It was really made for sculptors. Uh, whereas uh, epoxy green stuff is actually plumber's putty um, that was found by sculptors in the 70s and um, thought, hey, this stuff works. Um, is a putty called Procreate. And Procreate is fantastic stuff. Why don't I show it in classes? I don't show it in classes mostly because um, it's expensive, really, really expensive. And if all you're doing is um, doing a few touch-ups and you're not really, if, if I were to sculpt, be, be a, become a fresh sculptor today and I was gonna be sculpting in putty, I would probably just go to Procreate and never touch green stuff. Green stuff is kind of a pain in the butt to be honest with you. Um, it's not perfect for everything, but it is also the industry standard at this point. And uh, Procreate on the other hand has a lot of the, it almost feels a lot like this mix. It's still not toolable and it still has a lot more of what green stuff offers, but it just moves them to the tool a little bit better. All right, so 
you'll notice how I'm going back and forth on all the hard edges because you'll see as I walk away, see how that relaxed and the hard edge kind of slunk away on me. So I'm gonna come back and get my hard edge again and keep doing that. And these are gonna relax a bit. And that's just, that's the memory I'm talking about. Green stuff remembers what, what form it was set into and it's gonna kind of try to hold that form a little bit. So you gotta be working against your memory whenever you're doing hard edges. Well, that's probably pretty good. It's a backpack. I actually probably should have a little more, more slope in the corners and it would be okay. But I wanted to show you guys how to form a hard, jet, hard edge. So with the magic of TV, boom, it's now cured. So at that point, you got to let it cure and um, go away and let it go. So to cure it, I often do put it under some heat lamps. They're not heat lamps, they're incandescent. It's my light studio back there. Um, um, I have a couple lights over it and I just stick it in my light studio because it gets fairly warm. You don't want it hot. You don't want to um you don't want to get to the point where you're um burning it you can burn it if it turns brown you're burning it it's so useful you can still use it but um you probably don't want to cast with it but you 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 definitely uh but you can speed up the cure to like a half hour instead of an hour or 20 minutes if you get some heat on it um but cured it's hard as a rock i mean I, it's not much i can do to this anymore right so this is my underpinned area and it has taken um, that very well. So why don't we now, um, I'm not gonna go onto the, 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 the buckle first. I will actually sculpt another one on this other side um, later on, but why don't we go on and we'll sculpt the backpack now and we'll add a shoulder pad. We'll add the shoulder armor on here. How are we doing for time? Almost one o'clock? Okay, I gotta speed this up. Anytime you teach a new class, you got to get that timing rhythm down. And it's uh, uh, these two classes have been are, are brand new for me. So I apologize if my timing gets a little uh, wonky. I'm trying to trying to fit it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this this uh, green stuff and mix. And I'm going to show you that yes, you can use the mix to do final detail work. Again, I kind of like green stuff better personally. But then I'm more of an organic sculptor, so I tend to do a lot more organic sculpting than I do hard edge sculpting. Um, doesn't mean I can't do hard edge sculpting, I just don't do it very often. So. I guess I did quite a bit on the chaos toad. So I'm trying to get this down to about a millimeter. So I'm using either a plastic sheet or um, the top. I love the top of this uh, Vaseline can that I have because it's got a raised lip that kind of gives me a millimeter directly in and of itself. So that helps me really get nice and even, uh, but I can't buy these anymore. So if I ever find this, so I, I wish I could get uh, Vaseline to go back to their old style can because if this one ever dies or goes bad on me or whatever, I will probably be crying. Um, anyway, so what you need to do now is essentially coat this backpack in um, green stuff. So what we're going to do, but we're also going to want to have a lip for the, the flap that comes down over the top of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut some strips and I'm going to start, and, and this is kind of like just construction at this point, right? So we're going to make the bottom for it. So I just take a quick measurement on how deep is the bottom and it's about that deep and I eyeball it. And I'm gonna just take and so how long is it? About that long. So take a snip. Boom. We're gonna make the back. And apply this on to the bottom if it behaves, which it doesn't always. So if your tool starts to stick, wipe it in the Vaseline that's sitting on your thumb. The nice thing about being a green stuff sculptor is you always have soft hands because you're always coating them in Vaseline. It's 
The bad side is you're always buying Vaseline and the pharmacist looks funny at you. So I'm just gonna seal that in. I'm not gonna worry about square edges at this point. So now we're gonna take and do the whole backpack. So I wanna get the rough width. So I'm gonna just kind of measure that out and compare it, figure out about how big that is and slice off that. And this time I'm not going to be too concerned about getting it perfect. Size wise, what we're gonna do is we're gonna lay this down. And I'm gonna readjust it to get it on there right. And I'm not too worried about fingerprints at this point because yeah, I'll be wiping them all away shortly. And I'm gonna seal it in along the back there so it doesn't, so it looks like it's not part of his back and seal it in to the base. And then, so you'll notice I've left it hanging. It's kind of like loose like that, right? That's so I don't get bubbles underneath it, right? So what I want to do is start applying it from the side down and apply pressure to it, swiping across it with my tool, with my finger, in the direction to seal it to that surface. If I were to do it the other way, I'd end up with big bubbles underneath it. So you don't want the bubbles, so you have to kind of apply it directly. So once I get to this side, I'm just going to slice that off and take this set that aside because we'll need that later and now I'm just going to seal that in and seal this edge down here we're going to make this edge come together I might leave that little lip because that lip will be nice to give us our seam line anyway because the backpack has seams so and let's now we want to worry about our hard edges so if there's any fingerprints, take your finger and then rub on it. Don't stop on it, rub on it with a Vaseline finger and you'll notice that all the fingerprints are gone. The best thing to get rid of fingerprints is a fingerprint. That is one of those little weird truths of sculpting. Nothing removes fingerprints as good as fingerprints. So now I'm gonna use my hard edge tool and just scrape in that seam to make a nice, tight, sharp seam on there. So you see how, the and this is probably the biggest takeaway of this class, is hard edges require time and energy to get a hard edge. And sometimes you will have to work a hard edge over and over and over and you might have to come back a half an hour later after those putties relax before it's fully hardened and redo all of this because it will relax and it that memory will put that hard edge back into a soft edge slowly on you as it starts to harden so sometimes with green stuff you really have to work and if this were pure green stuff we could get a hard edge not a problem but you're gonna have to work it more. You're gonna have to come back and check it and keep an eye on it. And you also don't wanna, if, if you get hard edges, you tend not to want to use heat to cure it because the heat will, will relax it even more than not having the heat. So that's pretty good and pretty much where I want it. So now I'm gonna take my fine detail tool and I'll zoom in a little bit here because this is a little bit more detailed. And holy cow, I've done all this without my Optivisor on up to this point. That's pretty crazy. Usually I'm blind as a bat. All right. So now I'm going to come in and just touch everything up with my fine. Am I in screen? Yep. And just come across and let's, we're going to just put a little bit of a stitch line right on the edge here. 
and I don't like the way that turned out. Sorry about some of this. I'm going so fast, I'm not able to put the attention to detail I would normally put into some of this. And we'll just put a stitch line along here. And the stitch line can be as fine as you want to try to make it. So I'm kind of going a little faster than I would. But that's because we got to get two other things today. So as you see, I would take the stitch lines and put them all the way around. In this case, this is one of those where it's the corners are stitched right together. So, and so you see that this this uh, light putty, the mix of epoxy sculpt does take detail just as good as green stuff. I just personally don't always like how it takes a. Um, I don't personally like how it takes um it, uh, how it feels under my tool i'm a i i just i guess i'm more comfortable with the the way this stuff is so much softer so you have to use much less pressure to do anything with it and um as a painter and you'll find this painters um you use a lot more pressure with your brushes than you'll ever need to for sculpting. Sculpting takes much more tool control um, than your paintbrush requires, which is seems like it should be the opposite, but it's not. Um, which is why um, I typically recommend to people that they spend time painting before they start sculpting because developing brush control with a paintbrush is very helpful for controlling the tool. Um, anyway, so we put that on. Now, this would be a really good time to not do any more um, because on that backpack and let it cure, right? If you had the time, if you didn't have to rush anything, if you weren't teaching a class, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, this would be a really good time to let it be and not... Uh, add any more details to this because it's it's soft under there, right? And you're not going to want to put a lot of pressure on that right now um, because you'll kind of mess up your surface. So this is where what I'm about to do is a little bit more of an advanced technique. So uh, just bear that in mind as I go. But what I'm going to do is so I got about the space for the top and then a little bit of space and then we're going to cut like a triangular flap. Um, and to this, I would later, once cured, add a buckle. Uh, I'd add a strap, just like I added the shoulder straps before, and maybe add a buckle, like I'm going to show you how I'm going to add buckles uh, on the other strap. Uh, but the buckle, I would definitely wait until this thing cures up before I would try to do that. So I won't be putting a buckle on this particular piece, but I will be putting this, but it's the exact same process as what I would show you on the other. So you just make a little diamond base there. Looks like a home plate. And get it aligned. That's yeah, okay if there's a little gap on the side. A real backpack might actually gap of this type of a, a leather backpack like this. Um, if you don't like the gap, you can always tighten that up a bit. In this case, I think I'll leave it. So just wrap it around. Tighten it down. And at this point, I'm going to be very careful here. Now, maybe we'll do a different type of closure. Why don't? Let me think. Some of this I'm making up as I go along here, guys. So hopefully that doesn't ruin the imagery. And let's put a stitch line along here. Still in frame, yep. And I'm sorry, it's not perfectly straight. I'm a little nervous teaching the class a little more than it would normally be. I tell you, it's definitely different being on a spotlight and talking to people 
and teaching <laughs> the new. Doing it when you're something to go and relax. Here we would want maybe we'll, we'll put a little clasp here. Like so, let's say he's got a little toggle clasp. So I'm just going to come in here and just cut in with the tool and pull up a little toggle. See that? I'll just pull this little toggle in. All right. And we'll just say that that's got a. There's a slit right here that that toggle's coming through. And cut one in on the other side. And then just cut a little bit of threading on that toggle. Now, if I were going to really do this, I'd probably spend a lot more time playing with it to get it perfect. It's this sort of thing does take some time to pull out. And if you make it, see this, is, see how it pressed away from me really bad there? Well, that's part of the whole, there's there's getting to be a lot of putty under there that's not cured. And so that makes it easier to push away from you. And that's one of the reasons why, like I wish this layer was cured. So all I was working on was this outer layer because it pushed in further than I would like um, with just a slip of the thing. Now, I could redo the whole thing or I could come and touch it up and make it look like it's so I'm, I'm kind of putting some little stress lines in here like it's kind of straining against that toggle a little bit. Um, for quick work, that's pretty good. Um, I probably would come what I would rather have done would have been to put the hole in and the stress lines and leave it and then come and put the toggle on top later. Um, but we didn't really have time for that. So that's the backpack. Um, questions on that? Okay, I see a couple questions. Since it's a mix of epoxy sculpt and green stuff, could you let it cure and then sand it to get the hard edges? Yes, absolutely. And I'll be showing you that real soon. How long do you place your putty in your light oven and what wattage do you use for your bulbs? Uh, I, I don't really use an oven, honestly. Um, I'll show you guys. You see those three lights kind of aimed at a photo studio back there? I think they all have like 60 watt reveal flood lamps in them and that's what I use for photographs. Um, that is my, and I'll, I like, <laughs> I'm switching everything to LED except for that because frankly, I, I, I use that as a putty oven as well. So I just turn those on and they cure within about a half hour, 20 minutes, so. All right, I'm going to set this guy aside and we're going to go back to the other guy to do the straps because um, to do the belt buckle uh, because I don't want to stick my finger in this wet piece of putty here. Normally when I'm doing putty work, I'd have this attached to a base, but then that doesn't fit and I'd be up here in the camera and in your face and it really wouldn't work very well. So let's talk about straps. So, um, Doing, let's see if I can do it in this stuff. Doing um, a belt buckle. So the way you do a belt buckle is you you essentially you take you lay a strap down, um, and you add on top of that strap uh, um, another strap, and then tease it out into a belt buckle, if that makes any sense. So that's what we're gonna do. So you take and you make a strap, just like we did in the very beginning. So the, the concepts I've shown you here so far are the same as what you would do, say, say you want to add cloth or add something else. Um, say you wanted to add like, um, who was it? I had Jolie the librarian, uh, was a figure before I was a sculptor, I, I started working on. My wife didn't like the fact that she was showing her leg off. She wanted a very prudish character, right? So she wanted the 
dress to be full, but the miniatures. So that was one that I had to learn how to sculpt some cloth on. Well, what you want to do is you want to underpin, just like we did with the backpack, first the shape of the cloth. Um, and then once that's cured, you come in, you put the, the last millimeter or two over the top of that cloth shape, and then work in your cloth folds using a color shaper over the top of it. Um, but it's exactly the same concept as what we do with the backpack of laying that down over the top of it. Um, does that make sense? Um, so if I don't, if we don't get all the way into showing cloth directly today, um, really there's no difference. And if you want a really good, the biggest problem with cloth is to know where the folds should go. And there's a couple good references. Um, uh, there's a book called Dynamic Wrinkles out there that really kind of talks about it. But I find that even better is to find a picture of somebody wearing a piece of clothing in a pose similar to what I want on the internet and use that. Um, just look well the folds are and copy it. Because I guarantee you right now there's there's a picture for everything on the internet. It's it's The internet has become the sculptor's boon. It's fantastic. I would, um, so I got a question. If you found that you had an error with your sculpt, would you always go back and fix the sculpt or would you try to use paint to adapt it? Realize depending on the issue could depend on the answer. Um, I would always fix it. So if anybody ever knows me on, on the forums and anybody who's known me for a long enough time knows exactly what I'm about to say, um, don't fear the scalpel. Um, the scalpel is your best friend. Cut it off, re-sculpt it. Cut it off, re-sculpt it. You are too good to... Um, allow errors in your sculpting. Don't do it. Go go fix it. Make it good. Um, I always, always, always recommend to people because you're never going it, to, it's, why would you, you, you wouldn't want to spend the time, um, uh, all that time that you're putting into painting that miniature, um, you're putting all the time into customizing and all the time into painting it. And um, why would you want to start when the, with a less than perfect result, you know? So I would always recommend going back and fixing. Um, and that's what the scalpel's for. If something's not quite right, like say, I decide, yeah, I really don't like that. I might just take my Dremel, grind that out. Uh, oops, <laughs> I'm not showing you guys. Say, say it's like, yeah, I don't really like the way that toggle turned out. It looks a little kind of kind of squidgy, right? So just... Either while it's still wet, maybe I'll just dig it out and leave a hole. You know, just kind of take it out of there. Just just maybe push it back down inside. Yeah, there we go. And now I got a divot there, right? So I couldn't quite get it where I wanted it to go, so I make a divot. Now I can come back with some green stuff later and fix that. Maybe I'll grind it out with a, with my Dremel and make a hole there so that I can actually then come in and, and fix that. But I would always take a scalpel, cut it off, and restart. Um, Story I often tell people, um, I don't know if any of you know of uh, the first human I ever created, um, Coraline Thaddington. She's a Victorian lady in the in Reaper's chronoscope line. Um, I did it because I wanted to see if I could do a human. And her face took me 13 tries to get it right. I cut the face off and redid it 13 times um, because... There was no way Ron was going to accept anything other than perfect, right? And I wasn't going to accept anything better than perfect because, frankly, I am who I am. You know, I mean, it's got to be right. So um, that's the nice thing about ZBrush. Um, there's an undo button. <laughs> Love that. Unfortunately, when you're talking analog sculpting, the, the scalpel is your undo button. So what I tell, tell them all my students, don't fear the scalpel. The scalpel is your friend, not your foe. Um, if you have to change something, change it, just, just do it. So, all right. So I made a strap. I made the end a little rounded. I did that on the, on, on the sheet, right? So now I'm going to just press this down. We're going to make a buckle. Okay. So this is the Werner Clocky special. If you've ever painted Werner Clocky miniatures, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Werner likes his buckles. And one day I started examining all of his miniatures to try to figure out how he does his buckles. And it came to me that it's actually quite easy to make a buckle. So you just basically um, 
tack it in and widen the, a spoon shape out of the top of the buckle. And so the putty, so the, the belt's coming in here, going through the buckle and coming out on this side. So then you just take your detail tool and you cut in the sides of the buckle. So you're just gonna cut in here and you just pull that down and cut in on this side and pull that down. So you're just basically defining the sides of your belt that comes through. Am I in? Yep. Pop in a little closer. So now I'm just gonna come in here and form the buckle sides. And this would really help if I wasn't shaking. I think the one thing I don't like about online classes is a lot to stop my own nervousness is humor and cracking jokes and stuff. And in an online class, I can't hear any of you laughing. So it feels like you're all just pissed off. All right, so now I have, so I'm just gonna cut that in. So there's the tab that goes through the buckle and holds the whole thing in place. All right, so now I wanna just clean up and I take a bit of time to clean this up, right? So you wanna make sure this belt comes out to be the full width. So it doesn't look like it's being squished by the buckle. And I tap it in a little bit down here. Just clean it up. Make your make your edges nice and nice and tight. Make the buckle nice and round if you want it round or square if you want it square. It's the same concept, one way or the other. If you want a round buckle, you'd start with a rounded end. Um, this is a semi-square with rounded corners, is what I was planning on. There we go. We have a buckle. And then a lot of times, so often I'll do this when this is still wet. Oh, this one is still wet. Ha <laughs> ha. This is the other miniature. Good. So then I can drill in my couple of other buckle holes and put one in here. Give a couple a look. You can use, this is often where I'll use my not so pointy pointy tool. Oh, you're a little, you're a little down. Thank you. This is often where I will use my not so pointy pointy tool to kind of make those nice even holes. Um, one challenging part of this is on where that peg comes through to make it as big as those holes. So to come through and make it look like it really is a hole through there without cutting into it too much. And you can come back and kind of tap those in a bit. So they're not quite so large. And then I often like to flip that end up so it doesn't look like it's just hanging there at the same angle and maybe try to get it to be a little crooked. I'll just distress it a bit. All right, you're getting really close to the bottom of the frame. There we go. And there you go, you have a buckle. Any questions on buckles? Would you use a separate piece of putty to add a belt loop? Oh. Good, good question. Um, okay, I'm going to answer that first question last. Let's go to the belt, the, the belt loop one first. Wow, um, that is a good question. You can do it either way. It kind of depends on how much time you have and what you want to do. So, in this case, if I really wanted, say, a little loop right here. I could cut, cut, pull her down, tap it in, pull it down, tap it in, and then work this belt under it and lift that loop up, right? But you'll see that it's hard to get it to really look like it's a loop over the top, right? 
So if I really want to sell it, that's when I probably would take and make a little strip of putty and put another one, an actual loop, belt loop over. So if I'm going to do a pair of pants or whatever, chances are I'm going to put my belt down and I'm going to take the time to not to cut them in and to actually, yep, I'm off. Um, not to cut, it's, it's hard for me to see and have it in the sweet spot at the same time. Um, so as you see, I can, I, I can work this buddy and I can make it work, but you see, it kind of is too narrow. It's not quite wide enough. So I've had to squish in the sides of my belt here and kind of work. So, um, so yes, you can do it either way. This is harder to make it convincing. The other one, it takes more time. So uh, what I would do with the other one is I'd wait for the belt to harden and then make little bitty strips of putty and put right over the top of them. I wouldn't even have to wait for it to harden. I could also put a, a strip over um, if I really wanted to. Where are we on? Oh, we got, got to cruise a little bit though, but you get the point. You can make the belt loop that way or you can take and make another rope and make another little, little loop and push it down that way that especially works if you want the loop to have tabs that go up to the um, above and below on the belt. So it would be like this. So you just pull that loop over, press that down on one side, loop it over the top, press it down on the other side. Get rid of that extra putty and use your putty tool, your clay shaper to flatten that out. And you also have, so two ways of doing belt loops. Personally, I think the latter one looks better. So, um, you know, it was actually faster. I've never done them both. So yeah, that latter one would be, would be faster. So that answer that question. Do I ever challenge myself by utilizing a flaw in the sculpt to build out or improve my creative process? Ah, well, the, kind of. Um, there is the Bob Ross thing of happy little accidents. I mean, that that's pretty much par for the course. Um, um, the, the, that you get the happy little accidents that kind of show up. So I mean, yes, sometimes I screw something up and yet it's better than what I would have done, but um from my perspective usually what i got to do has to meet client demands or meet some sort of um something for somebody has to, you know so um it's got to be right it's got to pass the ron hawkins seal of approval or jim jim ludwig seal of approval so i don't really have the luxury of saying yeah i'll just work around that you know so um so armor Suppose you wanted to do a little bit of armor plating on that shoulder pad. So you see, I got a lot of fingerprints on there, uh, but yet my finger doesn't fit in there too well to get them off. I can get a little, some of them off. Finger works the best, but you can come in with your clay shaper. And suppose you really want that armor to be a two, a bi-level piece of armor that's kind of sitting over there. And we want to have a nice, getting off my thing again. So you want a nice point in it. Right here, we'll just cut. This is going to be real fast and dirty, guys. So don't expect this to be perfect. Um, this is responding to feedback here. So, um, but it's the same thing as I did for the backpack, just a different shape. So, right? So, but you're just thinking metal now. So now you're like, yep, this is going to be even more. I'm actually kind of making a raven's beak here, aren't I? Um, that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, sometimes the creative process does get a little fun, just like, uh, oh, maybe I'll keep that. Um, notice I'm just putting in that medial ridge in there, trying to copy that from one to the next, and then I'll just come back up here and I'll tighten it up, make it a true diamond, and then start working this edge. So you work it, 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 you work it. And that's it. You just got to keep working back and forth, above, below, above, below, keep swiping. And again, if this was going to be, I might undercut it a bit here. I'm not, 
going to put too much more time into it right now because I have got to get to showing you the weapons because that is a very long intensive. But that's how I would build, build a plate of armor, right? So if you're doing a whole suit like that, um, chain mill is a whole nother issue. <sighs> yeah, I didn't think of chain mill until just now. Um, let's do chain mill real quick. Chain mail, you want a not so pokey tool. So this is gonna be a chain mail backpack suddenly. So if you want a picture of the backpack, take it now because it's about to be changed. Um, the chain mail is essentially you lay out your cloth or whatever you want the chain mail to be the shape of it. You want it to be one millimeter thick, no more. Um, when you get much more than that, it's just not going to work. And what you do is a bunch of little C's. So you just start making a whole bunch of little divots and you can have the chain mail can be right to left or up and down. And then you start at the top and now we work the next row in. And so you don't want a really sharp pokey tool. This is what the uh, not so sharp pokey tool is for. And you just keep working them. So one is you're pulling down and the next row you're pushing up. And down. I'm doing this extra fast. But you're just getting those links in. One link at a time. Bam. So, yeah, the chain mail is funny. Is that I didn't even think of showing you guys at first because it's just one of those things that I take for granted. Because once you get it down, it's almost zen. You can just like totally, it's, it's so relaxing. You can do a whole figure of chain mail and just do nothing but chain mail for, uh, without even using a single brain cell once you get going. Because all the work is laying it out ahead of time. And voila, that's chain mail. If you want it finer chain mail, use a sharper tool. If you want heavier chain mail, use a duller tool. Um, you can also go the other direction and, and do rows going this way, which gives a slightly different look. It's really what you want to do. Chain mail. It also works for knit surfaces. If you paint that purple, it'll look like grandma's sweater. Anyway, any questions on that stuff so far? Any tips on trying to create two identical armor? Ooh, care. Lots and lots of care. Hardest thing you can do in anything like this, especially if you're not using like a ZBrush or a program that can copy paste, is creating two of anything that are matched. My advice on that is do them at the same time. So, okay, suppose you have two pauldrons, right? You're gonna do the pauldrons on it, right? So you're gonna use this putty to do one shoulder pad and you're gonna do this putty to do the other shoulder pad. You do them at the same time. You flatten them out at the same time. You shape them at the same time. You do mirror images of them. You pick them up, you put them on the miniature at the same time and you do all the shaping together. That way it's fresh in your mind. You got two wet putties at the same time same time so if, uh, if i read you correctly when you say match set you met mean each side identical to each other um that would be how i would approach that um that's always the toughest thing is getting bilateral symmetry in hand putty and the way to conquer that is to do them at the same time and then keep working them for hours and and only do as much of it as you can get, don't try to do the whole suit of armor at once. Do it in layers and in pieces so that you have the time to work it, work it, work it, work it, work it, and keep working it to keep it sharp, to keep it whatever. And it, it might take you multiple set, you know, four or five sessions to get through the whole suit, right? Um, one thing I see beginners do a lot, a lot, a lot, is they rush things. And we are really low on time, and I've got to get going this blade if we're going to get it co covered. So. All we're going to do is create a blade now. I'm going to break out the anvil. Things are going to get loud and noisy and fun. Um, so essentially what we're going to do, there's a couple things that you can do. For a blade, I, I know a lot of people don't do this, but I like to do this because maybe I'm a glutton for punishment. Maybe I am just enjoy forging things, but I typically forge. So what I'm doing is I'm just straightening out this wire right now. I typically forge a lot of my bladed weapons by by hand. And so like I'll say, we'll cut the tip in a little bit here with a, God, I'm shaking so much. Um, 
So I'll, I'll often forge a spatula. You don't have to do this. What you could do is, is say, use a thinner wire, but then I don't get the nice thick wire. And so I will often forge the shape myself. And if it's a one-sided blade, I'll hit on one side of it and try to, try to flatten out one side. If it's a two-sided, I'll just make a big flat spatula. And so today I'm making a two-sided broadsword. And you'll see, so if you're new to forging, if you've never done it before, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, moving the metal, making it do what you want it to do. Uh, um, I'm not going to forge the whole blade. I have um, done entire forged little copper blades for miniatures that have needed nothing but a little touch up. Um, so like I could take this and file this down into a sword for an adventure uh, right now and make it just all out of metal. Um, I actually do like doing that a lot uh, just because it's so, I mean, you know, it's going to handle the casting process because it's, you know, this one's getting a little thin now. Um, it wouldn't be able to be used at this thickness. But if you wanted to do it that way, you could start with a thicker one. But this is good for home hobbyists because you can make a real little blade, um, forge it out, grind it out, grind it flat, uh, grind in your bevels, and actually um, make real little blades for your people, right? Um, honestly, show forge and fire, yeah, it's bigger. but and you don't need to use the heat on the copper, but uh, the techniques are fairly similar. So uh, you can actually do it. So there's my spatula. Uh, I wanna make sure it's perfectly flat. So the way I'm gonna do with this one today is, do I still have, I good. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the tip into it. And then this is where Sam, so I'm going to cut it off of its wire. I always wait until the end to do that. And at this point, I'm going to quickly forge some shoulders into this blade. That stays nice and straight and try to use the anvil to, I want to get that flatter right at the shoulders where the cross guard is going to go. Flatten it out. It's gotten banana bananaed on me a bit. So grip it, I'm going to just bend it. It's getting to the point where it's not bending very well because of the forge hardening. Uh, um, that happens. Not such a big deal here because we'll fix any errors uh, that I made in the forging with the putty. So quickly moving on. So I can take and clean that edge up with sandpaper. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time doing it, but but if I were, just, and I really wanted to make that nice and clean, I'd probably, I mean, like I said, I could take that and use either my Dremel or sandpaper and actually cut bevels into this and make an actual blade. Um, this one's gotten a little thin for that. And it's gotten thin because I intentionally made it thin because we are gonna make it the other way. And that is where you put it down on a piece and you roll out your putty. No questions have come in. I hope I haven't just gone too far down the what the hell is he doing track. So just like we did before, so for this time, I'm just going to squish this guy down, make a nice blade shape out of it. So could have used the blade just like I made for um, a ribbon. Doesn't really matter. 
but I'm going to just peel that up. I'm going to put that down over that blade. This is how I do most of my fantasy, my weaponry and stuff that I make um, for characters and such. So I'm going to get, get it to stick to the, so the plastic that I'm using, I'm using a Plano um, insert that works really great. Um, the other thing you can use is an old hotel card. You gotta put a little more Vaseline on these, otherwise it won't come off. But these Plano ones are perfect. The, the green stuff comes right off of them and they work great. So seal that down a little bit more. I'm gonna just kind of put a little bit of a bevel on there. I don't want it over my handle at this point. So we're just gonna cut that off right there and right there, cause that's the hilt of the sword. All right. All right, so at that point, I'm gonna cut my sword blade into it. So get my shape. So I'm gonna use the scalpel. And this is where I prefer scalpel over X-Acto knife because it is so sharp. It doesn't stick to the putty and it comes off clean. See? You'll hear all the, a lot of the pro sculptors who work in putty will often talk about how scalpels are far superior to uh, exacto knives. So one of the problems I get with the Plano is that it almost doesn't stick enough. <laughs> so sometimes it's like, especially if the putty is starting to harden up a bit like this is, it doesn't want to stick. And I almost need it to stick more. So to show that, I'm going to stick it on this card that I know it will stick harder to, because it always sticks to these a little harder. And then, so now I just want to sculpt in the forge, the bevels. So I'm just going to run my tool at an angle across that putty, moving the putty into the general shape of what the sword blade should be. All right. So I'm putting in my bevels and have my riser in the center. This would also be the time that if you say you wanted to have a fuller blade or designs on the blade. Um, well, designs you might want to put in after as raised, but anything that's indented. So suppose we wanted a fuller, I might take say a round tool or bead or something and I can pull say a fuller down the center of this blade. Um, and the sky's the limit. I mean, you can make whatever you want, right? So this is just a, I don't know, found it online, thought it looked cool, bought it, it works for things. I have these round ball tip tools that I use for certain things. They're good for, well, doing stuff like this or setting in eye sockets into skulls and stuff. I have several different sizes. I'm not even sure what they're called. It's something, it's Martha Stewart sells them. Um, Sorry, I don't know what they're called. I just found it. it was one of those things where I'm just, because I was buying beading supplies that they showed up in my toolbox Amazon feed one day. And I was like, hey, that might be cool. And you're gonna find that a lot as a sculptor that there's like, I find a lot of tools at things like estate sales and that kind of thing. Um, the other thing you could do with that fuller is you could grind it out afterward using a Dremel ball. So. Um, I, I do a lot of my work with Dremel. In fact, this is, I'm feeling a little handicapped here today doing some of this work that we're about to do uh, by hand because I'm used to doing it with my Dremel tool. Uh, but I really just can't show that. I have, that's over on my jewelry tool and I don't have a standard hobby Dremel anymore. So um, it's not really movable. <clears throat> so my, the station and that just don't work. So. Get your shape as close to what you want. And this is just like a big giant's blade here. You know, like we're making this for that ogre. So, but get your blade about as close as what you want. And yes, it is one-sided. So here's how you remedy that. So now this has to go here. Okay, that's about as far as I can go right now. Um, I could add a cross guard right now, maybe. Um, 
that that can be or if i want something more ornate i'll use uh something else to the cross guard but then after it cures it's going to be like this i didn't put a fuller in this one this one's already done though so you pop it off your tool and you'll see that you get it looking just like that right so now you take some more green green stuff or not green stuff um what do you call this stuff uh, epoxy sculpt mix and i think i have almost enough i'm gonna rip the backpack off of this dude and use that since we're not actually using that. So I'm just going to shape that out, get it into a nice flat again, just like we did before. Use the blade to mark where it needs to go. I think I need a little more length. So to add some length, I'm just gonna fold it over, press it into a little bit more length. And just push it out. Just push and putty. Sometimes I feel like Bob Ross, like I'm just talking to myself. I see, I can see where he, <laughs> it's, Really odd doing a class like this where you can't see your students and have no idea how they're reacting to things. So I'm just going to cut around that shape now. I've adhered it to that putty. So I'm just going to use my tool and get that cut away. The scalpel might actually be better for this because it would be a little cleaner, but I already had this tool in my hand, so um, I used it. And you'll find a lot of sculptings like that. The tools, everybody talks about this tool for that or that tool for this. And to be honest with you, use what tool works for you. You will not find two sculptors who use the same set of tools for the same things. I mean, it just so many of us have invented our own tools. We make our own tools and we do what works for what, for purpose. And a big part of being a sculptor is just figuring out what works for you um, and inventing things and half the fun is the inventing things so now I just want to pull that up off the board because that's secured and that's sort of secured now getting it off can be a bit of a struggle especially since somebody forgot to freshly um, fastening that area so you'll see so now it's just it's on there right but it doesn't look like the other side so that's the next step is you've got to hold it in some way, shape, or form. And I will do that by sticking it with my pliers into a cork. And that allows me somewhere to hold it while I take my tool and work a bevel into it. I'm going to have to put, support it with my finger because it wants to turn away from me. If it's turning on you too much, one trick for that, you need to take it, throw it on your anvil. If you have one, your another hammer would be also work as an anvil, by the way. For this purpose is a hard, any hardened metal surface. I have used the, the faces of one hammer as an anvil held in a vise. Uh, that actually works as a really good anvil for, for uh, miniatures, but you flatten it out a little bit and then it doesn't turn in the cork so much. This might be a little too short of a tang to not turn, but it shouldn't turn as much now. So, and you can lay it down in my off screen. Nope. And just work that in. So what I'm just trying to do is I'm trying to get those bevels worked in, but this putty's starting to get hard on me. Um, so the basic concept is the same as what we did before. Uh, this is going to drive me insane, guys.
I guess I'm just going to hold it with a pair of pliers and do this. <sighs> you know, they, this worked before when I was doing it in practice. So, because it's starting to set up, I'm having to put considerable pressure on it right now to get that to uh, just move. Uh, the putty's starting to get a little firm on me. That's okay. The nice thing about firm putty at the end of the stage like this is it takes an edge pretty well. Um, that's pretty good. I don't really like these edges here. I might have to come back later and fill those in with a little excess putty. Um, or while I'm still got it wet, pull them down and get that cleaned up. It doesn't have to be perfect at this stage. I'm not trying for the finished weapon yet. Um, you just want to get it close. And the reason you want to get it close is it saves you time later. And I'm going to cut away the excess that's formed. Use the old, old one as the guide. Uh, flip it around, do the same thing on the other side. There isn't any excess on that other side. And there we go. So I'm going to stick that back in the cork so nothing touches it. And you have a sword blade. So put that away. Go to our magic. It got done while we were uh, it cured. Um, and so here is that cured up sword blade. So the next step is sandpaper. So now you want to get everything straightened out and just grind it on some sandpaper. Get the bevels nice and really sanded out smooth. Um, right now I'm using, I want to say 80 grit. So uh, you probably want to get a lot smoother than that if it's your final paint job. But I start there because I got a lot, to, a lot of stock removal to do. So I just want to be true to those bevels and get them pushed in correctly. So I do all my final shaping. Like I said, I would actually probably, well, big flat planes, I'm going to use sandpaper always. You know, that gets me a nice straight edge if you use it on a hard surface like that. If you are doing weapons for the miniature industry, they must be at least two millimeters thick at the spine and one millimeter at the edges. That is why your weapons are always big and clunky on your miniatures because the metal will not flow through more than one centimeter of um, metal at a, um, when they're casting it. So if you are doing this and you wanna be a pro sculptor, you have to have thick and chunky weapons. Even though you've always said, if I ever get to be a sculptor, I'm going to make realistic weapons. And then you find out that, nope, no, you are not, because it won't cast. If you're doing it for yourself, make them as thin as and realistic as you want. All right, so that's pretty much there. So the next step is just continuing what we've done before. So it's all that same thing. So remember, you're just refining shapes and adding. So, I mean, what, what, what could we do with this handle? We could do anything really at this point in time, it's a blank. So we could add wire to it and make a really big cross guard. Um, I could take um, this epoxy stuff because uh, epoxy sculpt mix gets hard and form is almost self armaturizing so we could form say a cross guard from this and make maybe a um, anthropomorphic hilt on this you could do anything i mean so the the hilts are kind of like your freeform creativity um the sky is the limit uh one thing i often i've done in the past is i've done uh wrapped guards uh so like for now i think i'm going to just go for kind of a shorter anthropomorphic. If I want longer quillions on it, you'd have to support them. So if I want a claymore and have a quillions that go out to here, uh, those would have to be wired or I'd have to create them separately out of a stiff material like epoxy sculpt and then add them in uh, once they're hardened. Um, this epoxy sculpt is getting a little bit uh, old so it's not sticky as much. It's 
one thing you find with putty is if you want to stick putty to hardened putty, it's best if you do it when it's fresh because our old putty doesn't like to stick. It's it's not happy about sticking. But you can go. So now here you see um, I'm trying to kind of blend those two surfaces together. And remember I talked about the burnisher way back at the beginning. <laughs> This is what a burnisher does. It just pulls that putty down onto that surface and it seals those two things together and you can burnish that surface to make it, it smooth and pull a layer of that new putty into the old putty, the old hard putty and get a nice, clean, smooth surface. Now, of course, this is epoxy sculpt, so I don't have to care so much about the smooth surface because I can always come back and sand it later, right? But if it was green stuff, you would have to work it quite a bit. Epoxy sculpt actually burnishes a lot better than, than green stuff does, the epoxy sculpt mix. So it is superior in some... I find making weapons and hard surface stuff, the epoxy sculpt mix is just so much better than the green stuff alone. Green stuff alone is far superior for things like fur and organic structures like I taught yesterday. Um, partially because it, it gets that nice soft texture, right? And, and it pulls into strands and all that kind of stuff, right? Things that you want to use for, and like uh, doing faces and doing sculpts like that, it moves like flesh moves and it moves like organic stuff moves, right? Epoxy sculpt makes it so it allows you to do a lot harder. So again, um, we could sculpt on this all day. I could, you know, honestly, if I was doing this really, I'd probably put a, a good hour just into the hilt alone. I, I would make this blade and then I'd spend at least one full session just making this. And, you know, we're getting down to 10 minutes here. I'm not gonna be able to make this whole blade. Um, <coughs> there, are, uh, there are a few questions in the okay. uh, Q and A section. What happens if you sand back into the wire frame? Um, yeah, so you, you do. Nothing happens. Um, you just see it. Um, so go ahead and sand into it if you need to. Uh, the epoxy sculpt is going to be that stuff sticks like you wouldn't believe. So I mean, it's just going to be stuck to it, and you could sand right back into that wire frame if you want. It's, you just see it at the edge. Um, I mean, we could do it if you guys want to see it. Um, break the tip off here. Well, so if I if I did that again, this is just for show, so I don't care. I'm not making this for anything in particular. I got a lot of epoxy on there. There, I just now I can feel the copper, right? So, so you just see a little copper. Uh, I've actually done that on some weapons where the the edge. Um, if anybody really wants to see, and I know somebody. So yesterday after my class, I told the people if they want to see feathers to go to my Boxer Rebellion uh, tutorial. I did a whole whip on the Reaper Sculpting Forum where, um, and in there I did a, the Wings of a Golden Eagle. I also go through this entire process of making a blade uh, in there. So that would definitely be something that, that you could do. Um, but. So yeah, not a problem if you if you see that. So if you can see that copper showing through there, it just becomes, oops, that was weird. Hold on, there we go, wrong button. Sorry about that. So it doesn't doesn't affect anything at all. It just stands with the, the epoxy sculpt and the copper sand together nicely. So um, like I said, uh, um, a lot of my edges, I'll actually have the copper be the edge um, because I can make it sharp then it's kind of cool, right? Um, actually, I use bronze. I do a lot of bronze casting. I use bronze sometimes for my weapon weapon blanks. Um, how fine do I go with the grit to sand the sword? That depends on how fine you want it for painting. Um, if I'm just going for casting, I might not go any finer than the 80 grit because it's not going to show. Um, maybe 100 grit. Uh, if I'm going for painting, I mean, I sand most of my models for painting with 400 grit sandpaper anyway, to, to get it super fine for the painting job. But from the casting perspective, that would be way overkill, maybe 100. Uh, you don't need to get it that silky smooth. This 80 grit, 100 grit, maybe 120. 
I think my, my the sandpaper sizes I usually keep around is 80, 120, and 400, 200 and 400. Um, but the 400 and stuff, that would be more for polishing my tools. So like the 400 grit sandpaper here, that's what I'll use to kind of resurface this tool, get a little bit more of a better edge on it if it's, if it's sticking too much or something. I'll use the 400 for that. Uh, but usually I don't use anything lower than 200 on a, on, a, on a thing. How would you make a morning star? Okay, so I'm assuming you're not talking a chain flail. A uh, morning star would be basically a large mace on a stick. Hmm. Let me think on that. So that's that. I mean, this is, brings up a good topic to discuss. Um, a lot of sculpting is problem solving and just figuring out. Okay, how am I going to approach something? So what I would do for morning stars, I would probably take. Um, I would probably take the spikes and shape them in the copper with my tools. So I, I'd use a diamond file to make spikes. So, it, you know, so you, you get the, the nice hard sided triangular cross section to the spikes. If you wanted it round, you could make them round too. Um, this is where I'd use maybe some of the bigger wire to do this with. This my wire might be a little small, but then I would, so I, I you know, work the spike until I got, got an end that I really liked right so for each spike and then i would clip that off and make the next one clip that off make the next one how many spikes do you want right and then i would take and use an armature wire of appropriate length cover it in green stuff epoxy sculpt and then stick the spikes into the fresh epoxy sculpt and let that cure this would be an underpinning and then come over the top of it with a millimeter of epoxy sculpt to make the wood uh, layer and sculpt in the wood look to it and maybe then uh, put out a strip of uh, putty and do a wrapped handle uh, like a, like we did with the with these straps, but I'd make them a little thinner and do a wrapped handle and then kind of bring them up around those spikes a bit and maybe add a little putty to the base of the spikes to fill them out a bit, that sort of thing. That would be how I'd walk, walk into it. That, so like I said, everything with, with sculpting is thinking through the little steps to get to the final goal. So you just have to break everything you want to do down into its component parts, like the blade, you know? You, 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 we start with, we flatten it. First, second step is make one side of the blade. Third step is make the other side of the blade, then shape the blade, then do the cross piece, then do the pummel, then do the guard. That sort of thing is like, you, you got to think of the different steps and how you would approach them and what basic shapes go into making that thing. Because all sculpting is, is breaking down the steps and figuring out the basic shapes. Do, do, do you need, a, you know, thinking through the shapes, is, does it, is that a circle? Is that a square? Is it a ribbon? Is it a, you know, and what do I need? And it comes down to balls and little little balls and little snakes and little sheets and you just uh, put them together to get what you want start with a bb or one of those steel eyeballs yeah so if you wanted to do um a morning star like a round-ended one um i'm not sure i would because i would i'd still would want the spikes coming out of so so let me think on that you could so because the epo unlike green stuff epoxy sculpt is self armaturizing out to a couple millimeters. So you could take and glue one of the larger BBs, one of these guys. See, and this is where different, you can come up with different ideas. So you could say that one of those bigger BBs or an even larger one, or just make a ball of putty um, and stick it on the end of a of of your thing and this is going to be too hard to do this with but then seal it down sealing it down is going to be impossible because it's way too cured up right now right but when it was fresh and sticky it would stick so stick it on the end of your weapon and 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 get it to get it to stick let that cure drill some holes in it then stick your spikes in then come with your surface area layer to do your final sculpting that way recommended videos on making cloth 
honestly, I don't have any recommended videos because I'm getting really new on videos. And cloth is, God, cloth is hard. Um, and we can get into a little bit of cloth. So, so, I mean, honestly, like I said, when you do cloth, it's the same as what we did on that backpack. Where'd you go? When you, 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 so, so like this cloth here. So what you would have done is you would have had your base anatomy. His butt was already formed underneath this. But you see the fill-in area there? That's underpinning. So Jason or Manor or whoever sculpted, Julie, I'm not sure who sculpted this one, um, would have come in and done all that underpinning just like we did with that backpack and had that whole thing under there underpinned let it cure and then they would have put a sheet and so the underpinning would have followed the flow of the, of the fabric except for the little bitty folds right there and they'd lay that sheet down over the top of that and have it extend past the edge right and that's when then they would take their clay shaper and that's this is one of those things where with cloth you really want the pointy clay shaper and a tool like this to cut those little wrinkles in right but knowing where to cut the wrinkles in and to make them you know so i'd take this and i'd cut that in and i'd shape that and work the cloth outline and then you'd take your your tool like this and you cut that hole in and cut this hole in and work it all the way around here and i would do this before putting that belt on so you would have the cloth would be already done and then put the belt over the top of the cloth. Um, but that would be how you'd work that. And so like this big fold here, that would actually be a fold. I would, when I laid that fabric down over the top of my underpinning, I would actually curl the green stuff sheet under and, and wrap it around to get that nice natural curl in it like that. Um, I could teach an entire class just on doing, just on doing cloth um, because it is so much more difficult to get perfect the best thing i could do but but you start here so what we did with this backpack is where you would start i mean here's where you're gonna you know we could probably make this backpack into a cloth one if i hadn't already made it into a chainmail backpack um i hope that helps um uh yeah uh gs's texture rollers no that is cheating for a professional i couldn't use somebody else's proprietary rollers so i have not used them i have to come up with my own texture rollers i do make my own texture stamps um so when necessary say like when i did the skin on the salatis or whatever um you can cut in i have done things where i have like um i made a stamp for the various um uh, chaos toads where you know i had uh, took some green, green stuff and I, I'm doing this right now on epoxy sculpt but you would not want to use epoxy sculpt for a stamp because it cures hard you want the little flexibility in your stamps uh, green stuff works great for making stamps out of um, so I do a lot I do have a little bit of a library of stamps that I use but I I tend to do most of my uh, detailing by hand so um, so for cloth uh, I, I do have one tutorial on cloth that I go through uh, my cloth and how I do it in detail. If you um, uh, go to the Reaper Sculpting uh, Forum and look up the visitation. Um, I sculpted Mary, a scene out of the Bible is Mary and Elizabeth. And there's a scene there where Mary's twirling and her skirts are twirling around her. And I have a whole bunch of different layers of cloth and Elizabeth was pregnant and has cloth drapery and I go into a huge long step-by-step -step tutorial on how to build the cloth out how to build the under layers and how to build in the different uh, levels of wrinkles and cloth and fabric um, that's probably better than I could even show you here because it takes a long time to build out cloth um, and to get it right hope that helps are we still good is there anything else or are we already done and I'm just talking to myself uh there's still people in the chat um okay. and we didn't have to end like right on time because there's uh the next class uh we have to start preparing for in about 20 minutes or so so okay so if that's it for questions uh someone posted the visitation thank you for doing that um good i'm glad the class uh was good for you <laughs> it's so hard to tell like i said these 
online classes are tough because I can't see the chat that's while I'm doing it so I reactions to stuff um, so thank you very much uh, for taking the class uh, you guys have been great um, and I hope to see what you do so all right So do I just close it then, David, or? Uh, yes, at the, oh, sorry, at the bottom right of your video, there's a little button that says end, and when you click it, you just have to hit end for all, and then it shuts the whole thing down.